We are in Romans chapter 4, continuing our study in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. What should we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Paul, the Apostle Paul, has been explaining to us justification by faith. He's been explaining to us how that both Jews and Gentiles were holding the truth in unrighteousness. Both need a Savior. Neither one of them have obtained to the glory of God. Therefore, because justification is by grace through faith and not through Moses' law, then the Gentiles can come in the, that, that gate as well as Jews, and the Gentiles don't have to come under Judaism. He's explaining this so everyone understands the mechanics of it. The sad thing is, very few people in Christendom pay attention enough to figure out the mechanics of it. Why are we talking about what Abraham found? Aren't we in the New Testament? Salvation is the same. Faith is the same. Grace is the same. Sin is the same. It's all the same. And every illustration of salvation, of faith, of perseverance, all every illustration used by the apostles in the New Testament is from an Old Testament situation, an Old Testament person. So it's obvious that the principles are the same. Even when the Apostle Paul is writing in Romans 12 about non-vengeance, he's quoting the Old Testament. Which means the principles are the same. Right. <clears throat> so why look to Abraham? Because Abraham is proof of the statement made in chapter 3, verse 21. Look at that. Chapter 3, verse 21. But now, the righteousness or the justification God of God, God's plan of justification, apart from the law, is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, I asked you last week, where is this justification by faith apart from Moses' law witnessed in the law and the prophets? In Genesis, yep. every patriarch before Moses was justified by faith without the law of Moses. It didn't exist yet. Okay, the law of Moses came approximately 2,500 years after creation. So, uh, before that, people were saved, justified by grace through faith, just like we are. Okay, so uh, in verse 28 of chapter 3, it also says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It doesn't mean without, the law says thou shalt not steal, so I can be justified by faith and still steal? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the deeds of the law for justification. Okay, and... So, we're talking about justification by faith. Apart from Moses' law, apart from Judaism, then it says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Okay, there's no real significant difference between the word by and through in that verse. It's just the way the Apostle Paul said it. Okay, so chapter 4. What should we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. Because Paul's definition of justification by works means I don't need a savior. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we're going to see that very clearly in this chapter. He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham <coughs> believed God, and it, what's it refer to? His belief, right? It was counted unto him for righteousness or justification. If Abraham was justified and had a righteous standing before God's court due to a perfect record of obeying God's laws, he has something to glory in, no doubt. If Abraham has a, was justified and had a righteous standing before God's court due to having a means of atoning for his own sin, he's really accomplished something. But Paul says that's not the case. He believed God. Now, what does that mean? Oh, that means he came forward and prayed a prayer. No, that's not what it means. It means that, oh, he said, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. Most everybody with the brain at that time believed there was a God. Um, no, Abraham believed God means that Abraham reverenced God's word and believed God's way was best and the smartest thing to do. 
And that's what he did. He could, he could be led and taught and corrected and improved by God because he believed God. Mm -hmm. when my, if my child believes me, then he's going to, if I say stay away from that, he'll stay away from it. If I say do this, he'll do it. If I say this is the best way to do this, that's what he's going to do because he believes me. Right. If you believe your doctor, if you put your faith in your doctor, he can nearly control your life. In fact, he can control your life, except where you don't believe him. That's right. It means Abraham was willing to take God's prescription and submit to God's program. He didn't talk back. He didn't try to modify, innovate, make up his own program. He didn't seek minimum compliance, get by a minimum effort, because he really believed God. Okay? Genesis 18, 17, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. A father who commands his household and they will keep the way of the Lord is because that father believes God. Genesis 26.4 God says to Isaac, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now what did that tell God? That guy believes me. He believes me. That's what it tells him. And if Abraham had not done that, it would tell him, he doesn't believe me. Right. So Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Okay? That it included obedience. Right. It included doing everything he knew that God wanted him to do, following God's ways, commanding his household after God. It included all that. Yep. Without that, he would not have been justified by faith. Faith is not just an intellectual acceptance of some fact. Because in all truthfulness, if you do intellectually accept something as fact, you're going to respond accordingly. That's right. If you intellectually accept that there's a tornado coming, you can't help but respond. Right. You will respond to that fact. So God knows that saying I believe when you're not doing anything, when you're not obeying, when you're not living accordingly, God knows you're a liar. Yes. And the truth is not in you. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Amen. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So, it is all of this. It was counted to him for justification. A declaration of righteousness by pardon. God said... And you know what? We're going to see later that this faith of Abraham that he displayed, that God documented, that God uh, highlighted, is the standard. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the standard. That's right. God said, you got to believe like that guy. Yes. You want to be saved? You want to be justified by faith? You believe like he believed. He's the standard yes. of faith. Not of perfection. Jesus was the standard of that. That's right. But of faith, okay? Mm -hmm. You know God is trying to save you? Do you ever stop to realize you need reconciliation? God does not. That's right. He doesn't need to reconcile with you. You desperately need to reconcile with Him. And God said, if you feel after me, you'll find me. God wants to reconcile with you. God has given the terms. God said, I know you can do what Abraham did because he did it. I know you can do what Noah did because he did it. And if you want to be saved, you got to do that. Yep. The Baptists want to say that one act of faith perpetually justifies. In other words, when I was in Baptist Bible College, and I look back on this and I say, oh, help us. Back in Bible College, there was arguments about when was Abraham saved? Okay? Was it when, he, when, when it actually said Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness? That's what they came up with. That's when he was saved. Well, what about the faith before that when he left her of the Chaldees and, won, and went out not knowing whether he went? Well, that must have been just working up to getting saved. And all the faith after that must have been just 
faith that, that you know serving faith and not saving faith how stupid how ignorant of the truth of God's word Amen. when was Abraham saved I remember arguing with people about it and thinking something's wrong here when was Abraham really saved Abraham was saved when he died in faith right. he was saved when he stopped his journey of faith by dying faithfully that's when he was saved now he was converted when he started walking by faith that's when he was converted okay while he was living in faith he was justified while he was exercising faith he was justified but he wasn't saved until he died in faith right. so to argue about when was Abraham saved is really goofy it shows that you don't get it you don't you're lost in the woods right. Paul uh, in, in uh, Romans 117 says for therein in the gospel is the justification of God revealed from faith to faith one step of faith to another step of faith one act of faith to another act of faith as it is written the just shall live by faith in 1st John 1 7 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin that's justification if we walk in the light while we're walking in the light we are justified Hebrews 3 14 for we we are made partakers of Christ his justification his salvation if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Continual justification is dependent upon continual faith. Right. While I'm living by faith, my justification is maintained because I'm making use of my heavenly priest. I, I'm trying to live by God's law. I'm walking in the light. And when I fail, I go to my heavenly priest and it's washed and cleansed. 1 John 1, 9. Okay? That only that's only for those who are striving to right. walk in the light. That's right. All right. Now, um, so Paul is trying to show that this is God's plan for justification, and this was only a temporary object lesson. Right. And it should not get in the way. Now, in in chapter four, verse four. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. This is Paul giving us clearly his idea of salvation by works. Yep. Okay? This is what it is through the rest of the Scripture. There is no other definition of salvation by works except this one. And what this says is, if you are trying out salvation by works, it means that the inheritance, salvation, is going to be a reward based on debt. Right. A reward based on debt. Okay? Now, how would that happen? Well, if I was born perfect and lived perfect, then God owes it to me as a debt. Right. Or, if I found some way to atone for my sins without this, then God owes me salvation as a debt. It's only right. Those are the only two options for salvation by works. So, when people talk about, oh, you know, this legalism, you're trying to be saved by works, most of the time they have no idea what they're talking about. That's right. Because how many people do you know are really believing they're going to get a forensic justification? In other words, they're going to show up in God's courtroom and they're going to open the books and say, man, this guy is perfect. He never broke the law once. And God's going to say, well, let him in. How many people really believe that? I hope nobody in here. <laughs> we need to get, go take you out back and talk to you if you think that. Um, now, the Jews did believe the other option. And that was the problem. That's why we're dealing with it. Okay? The Jews believed that this right here, the blood of bulls and goats, did atone for sins. And because they were practicing this, regardless of how well they did this, they were really, you know, they, they really liked this part. They didn't necessarily like this part so much, but this was only supposed to be for those who embraced this. Right. The, the walking in the light. And for a time, this was God's plan for them to practice as a picture okay of the real the real heavenly operation so they believed that they thought that they were going to be saved by the works of the law by the deeds of the law and so Paul says over and over by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified now what that means is by the deeds of the law alone without this okay for a Jew to believe as a Jew that you're supposed to do this but then they believed on Jesus as the Lamb of God who, who 
if this was just teaching about the heavenly Jerusalem, that's what they were supposed to do. And we'll see that in this chapter real soon. So, it says, To him that worketh, or to him that seeks a forensic justification by self-atonement, blood of bulls and goats, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And that's where the Jews stumbled. That's where they stumbled, right there. Uh, chapter, verse 5. But to him that worketh not. Now, the, the antinomians love this because they put their own definitions in here. Worketh not means doesn't seek justification through this. Worketh not means I'm not depending on perfection to get a forensic justification. And I'm not depending on the blood of bulls and goats and my, my ritual ceremonies to get a forensic justification. I'm not depending on that, okay? Worketh not for that is what it's talking about. That's the context. But believe it, like Abraham, on him that justifieth the ungodly. Well, if, 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 someone once said, it says he justifies the ungodly. So that means we can live ungodly. No, no, no. It's the reason you need justification is because you were ungodly. But he doesn't justify you while you're ungodly. Right. He justifies you when you repent and walk in the light. Okay? But it's because you were ungodly that you need justification. Now you think it would be so obvious. His faith is counted for righteousness. Pray tell me, where is there any indication that Jesus' righteousness is counted to someone? His faith, his faith is counted for righteousness. Right. It doesn't say anything about some Jesus' righteousness put on your record. It doesn't say it. It's not in there. Okay? His faith is counted for righteousness or justification. The word counted in this chapter, the word reckon in this chapter, and the word impute in this chapter are all the same word. Okay, the translators just wanted to make it look uh, more, you know, more elegant, nice, so they use different words to mean the same thing, synonyms. Um, but the word is logizome, means to record or take account of. It's where we get our word log. Log book, okay, log in. The same way we get, it's, it, it, the, the root is logos, word. Okay, verse 6. Now listen to this. This is the clincher. This is the proof, all right? He says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth. Here we have a description of the situation. Mm -hmm. Describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Okay? What is it? How is it? What is it? Okay? Saying... Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, the imputation of righteousness is simply the non-imputation of sin. Right. Okay? So you have your record in heaven. I don't have a hearty room up here. Here's your record in heaven. Got your name at the top. Every time you transgress the law, it's recorded. And when the Bible talks about treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath, it's talking about mm -hmm. this right here. Every time you trespass and come short of the glory of God, it's recorded. You want to face that on Judgment Day? No. Okay. Being that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, being that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, there's got to be another way to get my record clean before I face God's courtroom. Otherwise, I am condemned. Alright? So, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven and covered, and God is not imputing sin to that man. That's justification. Right. That's pardon. Okay? That is justification. Um, Even as David described it, the blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth righteousness. Would you like to have this record? Mm -hmm. What does that say? It says you're righteous. Yep. It says you didn't transgress. Now, is that true? No, it's not true, but it says here, Blessed is the man, saying, Blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's justification, and that happens when you repent, you embrace God's law, and you make use of the priesthood of Jesus Christ, 
If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Yep. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore He is able to save them to the uttermost, all the way to the end, that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's what this is all about, okay? You have a record. You've got to keep it clean. You've got to, number one, walk in the light. Otherwise, you're not even eligible. Jesus right. will not be your high priest unless you are striving to walk in the light. Right. He's not, he didn't die for, to save rebels. He died to save the repentant. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the faith of Abraham. Okay? Psalm 32 is what Paul is quoting as David. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputed not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. That, that's included. Okay, that means you're repented. That means you're walking in the light. Then it says, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me in conviction. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Then he says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, the lawlessness of my trespass. Okay? While you are hiding your sin, while you're covering your sin, while you're keeping it back thinking nobody knows, God knows, and uh, your bones are going to wax old with conviction. His hand is going to be heavy on you in conviction. You're going to feel like a rat because you are a rat. Yeah. Okay? And it's not going to be fixed by going through a ritual, praying a prayer, getting baptized, having an emotional moment. That's not going to take care of anything. That's right. The only thing that's going to work is when you confess and forsake your sin, the Bible says, then you'll have mercy. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh the sin shall have mercy. It's all this same operation. When you confess your sin, then you can come to Jesus Christ. Number one, when you confess, you repent, you line up with the law again. You make things right again. You tell the truth if you've told a lie. You've been lying, you go back and tell the truth. If you've stolen, you return it. You get things right with God's law, and then you can come to Jesus, and He can wash you clean. If you don't do that on your own accord, by your own faith, you will not be saved. That's right. And this is not acquittal due to innocence. This is pardon due to God's merciful reconciliation with those who will reconcile. Okay, now, verse 9. Paul is working up to verse 9. Cometh this blessedness that we just talked about upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. You see where he's going? Okay? You see where he's going? Now, come with this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? The answer to that was yes! From the time circumcision was inaugurated to Cornelius. This is post-Cornelius. Okay? For during that time, the answer was yes. The only way you could enter into this blessedness is through circumcision, Moses' law. You know, I got to looking at the dates from the inauguration of circumcision to Cornelius. It was approximately 1920 to 30 years. The, the chronologists are, are a little off, okay? And but that's interesting. That's how much time the Jews had. That was the time of the Jews. Abraham to Cornelius. Now, think about that. If you take and put the equal amount of time to the Gentiles onto there, we're talking 80, 41, all right? 19, 1920 plus 1961, or actually it's, it's 1920 plus 41, okay? Because you're going from 19, you're going from 80, 41. Mm -hmm. That brings you around 1961. Uh, if you go on up to... 1930 years, you're going up to 1971. So that means, think about it, I wish I had the exact dates. Yeah. Okay, I wish I knew which chronologist was right and, and they were exact. That means from Abraham to Cornelius, basically it was the life of the Jewish nation, I mean, the time of the Jews. From Cornelius 
to 1960s and 70s was the equal time to the Gentiles. Ooh, that make your hair stand up, won't it? Yeah. Interesting. I wish I had the right dates. Okay, the question. Back to verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Abraham was justified by faith before circumcision was inaugurated. Okay, so, he's, he, this is the clincher. The Apostle Paul is making his argument undeniable. That this is, the, this is the basis for justification and not Moses' law because Abraham was justified this way before circumcision and 430 years before Moses' law. Right. So it's conclusive. He said, how is it then reckoned? And then verse 11. And he received the sign or the token of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, like him, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. The, fa the father Abraham is the father of two groups. Yes. Okay, God designed it. This is plan A. Yes. All right, from the very beginning. God gave him justification by faith recorded in the Bible. God imputed it to him for righteousness and justification. He was justified because he believed God with the faith of Abraham. Yes. Now, that was before circumcision. God gave him circumcision. God gave Moses law. And so Abraham was justified by faith before circumcision and after circumcision. He's the father of faith to all who are Gentiles. And this is post Cornelius now. Now he's the father of faith to all the Gentiles who will believe with the faith of Abraham. And he's the father of faith to those who are not of the circumcision only. Notice that? Mm -hmm. Not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. In other words, uh, they are in tune with God. They are believing and following God, which means now they believed on Jesus. They've accepted His Son. So, the problem is believing that we can be saved by circumcision only right. as a Jew. As a Jew, believing that. Okay, we can also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Notice it says steps. It didn't say step. It says steps. It's a life. It's many actions. Walk, walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had. There's your prescription for salvation right there. Better than the Romans road ever thought of being. Okay? Amen. This is the true Romans road. You gotta walk in these steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, Moses' law, but through the righteousness or justification of faith. Do you want to enter into his inheritance? When Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Was he talking about this? Yes. Does that mean everybody in Brookfield who's meek inherits the earth? No. He was talking to Jews, and everybody who was a Jew and was meek was in line with God's will. Okay? So the equivalent today would be if you're a meek Christian. Okay? Uh, not, just, not just being meek or your definition of meek. Meek means that you are keeping rank under God, right. doing His will. Like Moses did. He was one of the meekest men on the face of the earth, the Bible said at that time. So, in order for you, uh, God said to Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So Abraham was the door, the standard of faith to all the world. And that means... When Jesus comes back and the meek inherit the earth, it'll be because they were in Abraham's bosom. Remember that term? We're going to read that in just a minute. Verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Okay, if they which are of the law be heirs, all the patriarchs are not. Right. Abraham isn't saved. 
the law didn't come to 430 years later. Okay? We're talking about these earth bulls and goats. We're not talking about Abraham obeyed God's laws that he knew. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the law of Moses as a package, as a system. All right? They, if, if only the Jews who are practicing Judaism be heirs, then faith is made void. That means uh, the salvation by grace, justification by faith is void because after all, we're saved by the blood of bulls and goats. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and the promise made of none effect because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. And so the antinomian says, oh, so that's what Jesus came to do is get rid of the law. No. That's not what it's saying. Okay? The law worketh wrath is a statement of fact. Where there is no law, there is no transgression is a maxim. It's a principle. No duh. If there's no law, there's no transgression. Okay? So what he's saying is where there is a law that has been broken... What is it doing? Is it justifying us? No, it's condemning us. The law worketh wrath, okay? So, if, if, the, if the Jew was to wake up and listen close, the plumb line is not all God gave them. He gave them the sacrifices. What was this all about? It was because they failed to live up to this. So this whole thing is teaching them that they are sinners in need of an atonement. Now, an atonement that doesn't really take away sin, if they are trusting in this system, all it does is going to, all it's going to do is rack up. Uh, this is going to keep racking up because this can't solve it. Right. The earthly, the blood bulls and goats can't wash that clean. So the law worketh wrath by itself. Circumcision only by itself. The law worketh wrath. Uh, if there were no law, there'd be no transgression. So the obvious is that where there is a law and there's transgression, it works wrath. That's all he's saying. Right. Okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> Next verse. Verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. What's faith? Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's faith. Look at that in Abraham's life. Abraham's faith is what justified him. You've got to have the steps of that faith Okay, so it is of that type of a relationship, God says. It is, a, it is a relationship where you're striving to please me and then you're trusting in my salvation when you don't. That's the relationship. That's faith and grace. Mm -hmm. Without you trying to walk in the light, grace is inappropriate. Right. You've got to try to walk in the light. Then grace becomes appropriate. So, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, Jews, Gentiles, all the nations, not to that only which is of Moses' law, but to that which is also of the faith of Abraham. Not the faith of Joe down the street, not the faith of Joel Osteen, the faith of Abraham. Not the faith of the Baptist church, the faith of Abraham. Okay? So you can go pray, you can walk the sawdust trail. You can bow and you can pray their prayer and get up and they can say, bless you son, you got it and can't lose it. But that's not what God said. Right. you got to have the faith of Abraham. Now, it goes on here. As it is written, verse 17, I have made thee a father of many nations. Okay, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations is a parenthesis. So let's take the parenthesis out and see what the sentence is actually saying. It says here, But to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham, verse 16, who is the father of us all, comma, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. So, it's not of the law, but it's of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all before God. And standing before God, and, and from God's perspective, God's program, Abraham's faith is the standard, and Abraham is the father of the believing, all the believers. So let me read you something. For Luke 16, 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Why? Because he's the father of us all before God. He's the father of faith. It's got to be his faith. That type of faith. God says, you be the friend of God. You have the faith of Abraham. You can enter into the glory. Okay? So, it went into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And he, in hell he lifted his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. 
And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to me. Dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, now who's telling the story? Jesus. Okay, he knew. He knew about this. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you there is a great gold fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that, that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, the guy that's praying is a Jew. He's a rich Jew that went to hell. Okay? Uh, he, was, he was putting too much weight on this. Right? He wasn't trying to live by this. He thought this would take care of it. He ends up in hell. All right? Now he, now he understands. Okay? He said, uh, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, which were also his Jewish brethren. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That's the faith of Abraham for a Jew. Yep. Go read your Bible. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now I understand they need to repent. They can't just trust the blood of bulls and goats. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, which was the Old Testament scriptures, the only Bible at the time, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's Jesus' plan of salvation yeah. via Abraham. You want to get to Abraham's bosom? You want to inherit the world with Abraham? You want to enter into his inheritance? you got to have the faith of Abraham. Abraham obeyed my statutes, my commandments, kept my charge. That's what it's all about. So faith means hearing and obeying God's word. And all with the faith of Abraham enter into his inheritance. It says here in verse 17, And calleth those things which be not as though they were, the antinomians run with that. Michael Pearl did. It doesn't mean... It, what it means is he called him the father of many nations when he didn't have a child. And Abraham believed God in spite of what seemed to be the evidence. Okay? The antinomian says he calls me righteous even when I'm rebellious. <laughs> and that I'm supposed to just believe. I'm supposed to believe that I'm really righteous. I'm supposed to believe that God sees me as a Jesus even though I'm a miserable failure and living in sin. Mm -hmm. And that's why antinomians are going to hell. Yep. Chapter, uh, verse 18. Talking about Abraham's faith. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which is spoken. So shall thy seed be. This is before he had a son. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He took God's prescription. He believed God's promise. He lived from faith to faith. And uh, we know Hebrews 11.6 says you've got to be a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The same Paul that's writing Romans wrote Hebrews. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. Okay? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, let me read you Hebrews 6.11. Here talking about the faith of Abraham. He, the Apostle Paul said to the Judean Christians, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises, like Abraham did. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so... So, after, listen, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. That's the faith of Abraham. The Bible talks about the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. So don't go arguing about when was Abraham saved. When he patiently endured to the end, he obtained the promise. There, there's your answer. Um, there are numerous places in the Bible... In Genesis 15, 5, it says, And he brought him abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if, if uh, thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall I seed be. 
Verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He was justified before God because he believed God. Now this was about 80, when he was about 84 or 85. About at least 10 years earlier, he left Haran. See, Abraham was the youngest of three brothers. Uh, two brothers. There were three brothers. He was the youngest. He had two brothers. You confused now? Abraham, uh, Haran, and Nahor. Haran died. Uh, Terah was their father. God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia and said, Leave. Evidently, Abraham convinced his father and his brothers to go with him. They traveled unto uh, Haran, most likely named after the brother Haran who died there, um, or who died previous anyways. They went there and they dwelt. And, and then they stayed there for a while. Nahor stayed there. And God said to Abraham, keep going. Abraham, the youngest of the brothers, is the only one who kept going. Kept going. Nahor stayed. He had to send a servant back to get a wife for his son back where Laban was living, remember? Okay. Back where Nahor was. But Abraham kept going, kept following, and so he had Lot with him, but then Lot took off after Sodom. So Nahor stopped short, Lot took off after Sodom, and Abraham kept going. I hope you're the one that keeps going. But, in Genesis 15.5, God spoke to him. He believed him. He was 85. About 10 years after, he left Haran. Left his brother Nahor there. He's 85. It says he was, it was counted to him for righteousness. But he was believing God. Uh, when uh, Stephen, when he's on trial, he goes back to when God spoke to him in Mesopotamia and told him to leave. In Hebrews 11.8, it says, talks about when he left Haran and, and went out. Um, and then... In Romans 4.19, it says here, He was not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. But that was when he was 100 years old. Okay? So that was 15 years after, in Genesis 15.5, it said it was imputed to him for righteousness. And then, in James 2.21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. But that was 125, uh, when he was 125 years old. So which scripture was fulfilled? The one when he was 85? No, it was fulfilled when he was 85. It was fulfilled when he was 75. It was fulfilled when he left Mesopotamia. It was fulfilled, according to Romans here, when he was 100 years old. So what does that tell us? It has to keep being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Faith to faith. Okay? Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone. It was imputed to him. No doubt. It was written 20, well, written 430 years later. So it wasn't just for his sake. <clears throat> it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it should be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. <coughs> Isn't it interesting? It says the faith of Abraham there, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Does that sound like anything we've read in Romans? How about Romans 2.7? To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. What is that? That's the faith of Abraham. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. The faith of of Abraham. Um, the important thing that you understand is that the argument here is not uh, just like the end of chapter 3. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish yeah. the law. Did the faith of Abraham establish the law? Yeah. We read it. Genesis 26.5 God says to Isaac, He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes. The faith of Abraham caused him to patiently endure in well-doing, seeking for glory and honor and immortality. The faith of Abraham caused him to be the friend of God. Okay? God is the lawgiver. If you're a friend of God, it's because you love His law. That's you right. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Okay. The faith of Abraham established the law. Your faith has to establish the law. Right. 
All right? The faith of Abraham, uh, all this ceremonial law that came 430 years later was just illustrating the process whereby God justified Abraham 430 years before. Because Abraham did not have a forensic justification. We all know Abraham was imperfect, right? God recorded it for us, his mistakes. But it also recorded his continual faithful yeah. striving. Are you listening? His continual faithful striving to be God's friend, to be faithful to God. And so th all this is showing the mechanics of it. Now in the New Testament, after Cornelius, uh, after 900, 1920 to 30 years of circumcision to Cornelius, now once again, justification can be had the same way Abraham had it prior to circumcision. Now, anybody who reads that and understands it will say, oh, now we understand why Cornelius could be accepted. Now we see what's going on. Now we get it. God is not just uh, scrap plan A and now he's going on to plan B. God is not acting arbitrary, you know, well, now, well, I think this is wrong now. Well, let's, let's stop calling that wrong and say it's right now. God doesn't do that. No. God's plan was from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's plan A. And so Paul, the Apostle Paul here, is explaining to us plan A. Let's stand together. That's Romans 4. If you understand Romans 4, you'll never fall for this Jesus' righteousness imputed to us or some other uh, form of, of false teaching. And you can take anybody to Romans 4 where it says, even as David describeth. Okay? Here it is. The blessed is the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. What is that? Saying. Mm -hmm. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's the description. That's the mechanics. David is saying, Paul is using David's word to say, this is how it works. He didn't say anything about God adding, well, let's write, let's write down some righteous deeds on your record that you never really did. That, that has no, no part of the program. Okay? God is not a liar. He's not going to write down something on your record that you never did. Okay? God doesn't see you as righteous as Jesus, His Son. No angel in heaven would ever claim such a thing. Okay? No, no, no person in their right mind would ever believe such a thing that God sees me as righteous as Jesus. That's, that's absurd. Okay? No. What God does is He sees you as a criminal deserving of hell who has repented and believed Him and has thoroughly trying to mend your ways because you see your error, you see that you were wrong, and you come to Him in total broken and contrite heart. He takes away the filthy garments. He washes you clean and puts a white robe on you like the prodigal coming home. And He adopts you and accepts you. And because of the blood of Jesus, He wipes your record clean. And there's no, there's no law condemning you now. There's nothing against you. There's nothing standing against you before God. That's beautiful. Amen. That's the good news. Yes. That is amazing grace. This other stuff is not amazing grace. It's amazing dysfunction. Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, the abortion of justice and common sense. But this is amazing grace. Yes. Any thoughts from the brethren? I was thinking that uh, free Cornelius Gentiles had come under become Jews. But even so, that was still the faith of Abraham that would have led them to that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the faith it of almost, Abraham... It was almost as if the Jews missed that. Because they were so focused on their, their law or being the seed of Abraham that they didn't even really recognize that that was the faith of Abraham well, bringing the Gentiles. Well, on the whole, you know, there was always those who did get it. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth got it. And we find that Zechariah and Elizabeth were uh, perfect before God. Um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now that's not forensic justification. That is trying to line up with this, obeying God in this. That's the faith of Abraham. 
Okay, and, and that therefore they were righteous before God. They were justified before God. But yeah, a lot of the Jews began resting in the outward signs. They had the outer circumcision, but not the inner heart of Abraham. They had the blood of bulls and goats and the ceremonies, but they didn't love God's law. And so that's and when Jesus came, preached that they would repent, and he came as the Lamb of God, and so forth, they stumbled all over it. Yeah. They weren't ready for it because their heart wasn't in tune with God. Yeah, the faith of Abraham basically caused people to do whatever God said whenever he said it. And so that, that would cause them to be circumcised. That would cause them to keep Moses' law. That would cause them to follow through. And then when Jesus came, it would cause them to accept the Messiah, believe the Messiah. When Cornelius came along and God said, allow Gentiles, they would do, the faith of Abraham would do that too. See, that, that, that's where God, you know, it's like he turned the corner real quick and all the Judaizers, the false brethren, went in the ditch. Because that was a true acid test. Do you really believe in Jesus and His, you know, or are you just kind of observing from afar, you know, just tagging along? Well, that got rid of them. So an uncircumcised heart is a disobedient heart. Right. It's a heart without the faith of Abraham. The righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. You know, we're, it's, it's a nice warning to us because if we're not careful, the things that we do out of obedience can become ceremonial. Well. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and we can have we can have just the right outfit, we can have just the right head covering, we can have just the right words to use and everything else, and still not love the law and think right. that we're going to be justified by what we're doing. Mm. When in reality, it's just not going to do a thing. For you can get up in the morning and say your prayers and read your scripture and go to church and put money in the offering and go through all the rituals and if you don't have the faith of Abraham you're just like the Jew yeah. and yet just like the Jew those things are required in order to have the faith in of order Abraham. to have the faith of Abraham yeah. Yeah. it's interesting to notice Abraham's faith was what you said growing faith it was taking him to higher and higher levels yes. the tests the tests seem to be getting harder and harder. I yes. mean, to leave, to leave your homeland, that, that's a big enough challenge. But then to be promised children, and that not seem to come to pass, it's like, I don't know. And then to be given a child, and then have it take, seemingly taken away, it's like, you're getting about as close to the heart as you can possibly get. Here. Exactly. So it has to be a, a growing faith. A faith that sticks with it. Abraham, if Abraham had gone 90% of the way and fallen short and, and stopped believing, he wouldn't have made it. After he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He had to continue to the end. You know, I'm thinking about the, the growing, the growing uh, upward slope of it, the, the quality of it being enhanced over the passage of time. Not just a matter of, okay, I've, I've been, uh, I have a revelation from God, I'm going to cling to it, never change. No, it's a it's an increasing plane of existence. And you know what? Nobody could do it for Abraham. Abraham had to do it on his own. Him and, him and God. And no matter how much we love our children, no matter how much we love our family and our church members, nobody can do it for you. You have to do this on your own. Right. Let's pray.